Well, thank you for selecting our session. We, um, <clears throat> we have a lot of material here, and uh, we've got a couple presenters. We're going to present it all and should get it done in, in less than an hour, and then have about 20 minutes or so for questions at the end. So we do want to kind of hold the questions at the end, if you don't mind. Um, I'm Alan Corelli, VP of Server Products uh, within Bentley Software. And in this session, I've got uh, these main topics that we're going to be talking about. I want to just do a brief overview. Again, Greg did a little bit of it about uh, the AssetWise platform and, and as it is for us, our mission. And then talk about these other topics that you read up there with proof points in product of what we're doing in, in these areas. So I'll just start with AssetWise. Uh, you saw this slide earlier uh, in the afternoon. You know, really, when you see what we're trying to do, it's sustainment of infrastructure assets from conception to decommissioning. And across that life cycle, you know, Bentley has been very much involved in, uh, <coughs> deeply in the first parts of this process. And over the last three years, through acquisition and organic development, we've offered more and more in the way of, of, of bringing products to bear on actually sustaining those infrastructures after they're created uh, in, in, the, uh, in the operation by the owner. And you know, one way I look at this is we always think of this as a, a linear line. If you try to solve this in a linear way, and which most people have tried to do, you, you see why we have all these siloed products. But one of the things that we worked with with ARC, uh, the ARC advisor group, is looking at this slightly differently and to say, you know, in reality, what we really have are processes that are continuous around project information management. And that has to do with we, we design something to create it the first time, but we continue to have to upgrade it, enhance it, and continue and, and through its whole life. And as you know, these infrastructure assets last hundreds of years, if, if, if not longer. And as we operate them, we have continuous cycles. We just don't turn it on. We have to continue to train and bring new people on and, and monitor what we're doing. And, and through this whole life, we're having to decide, how do we spend our money best to do that most efficiently and in the best way? And really what we need to do is we need to be cognizant that these things are happening continuously and tie them together in a way that all the information can not only pass between these uh, fluidly, but that it's all available to use in a business decision context as well, because we can design much better if we can see how we operate. We can operate much better if we know how we designed it and what we wanted it for. And so that's really what this topics of the information modeling, integrated projects, and intelligent infrastructure is all about. And, and, and Greg went through that to, uh, just, just now and back to this spanning from CapEx to, to OPEX. And I think when you saw the last bit, you're probably getting a little tired there at the end of the presentation, and that was a big picture, but it is a big picture. And you see we have many, many proof points in that big picture of what we're doing, and the rest of this presentation is going to put a little bit more detail behind those. So I'm going to start with that kind of, if you think about that middle red circle just there of the information management flow when you're trying to manage an asset's life cycle. And I want to highlight that with um, kind of a, a traditional piece of information here first. We're actually releasing a product this month, <laughs> and it's the uh, Select Series 3 version of our EB Insight uh, product, which is what we use <coughs> within AssetWise and within ProjectWise to do change management, configuration management, and the meta information uh, flow uh, of, of all this uh, information we're talking about. And in the area of configuration management, where we're talking about managing the design basis, the requirements, the regs, about what we want to, what is allowed actually to be out there. And in the system, not only what's allowed out there, from there, what is out there, and what information do we have that says that's the way it should be out there. And it's really these three concepts that are really the fundamentals of configuration management is that we know what we say is there, what we say is there is what's supposed to be there, and then let's make sure it's there. <laughs> and we have to put that under change management all the time. And if we can do that, then you have control of what's going on. And EB, as Greg mentioned, has been certified by many institutions and looked at as best practice in, in others. Now what we've done in this release, I'm uh, just highlighting a few areas. 
if we're going to be the definition, and we are in many places, that we're the master definition of what is supposed to be there, then obviously there's a very deep integration point with the work management systems that have to manage the upkeep of that asset, such as SAP or Maximo. So this year, in this release, um, we are having a new module uh, that is SAP certified, uh, this connection service, connection services. It allows you to configure uh, a very easy asynchronous or synchronous on the server, passing two ways of information from EB to SAP uh, is the one that we got certified. We, it can also be used with, with Maximo and other systems. Configurable, we have templates for SAP and for the best practice workflows in work management. What we have in gray here is we are working on best practice templates for material management for the use in, during construction and also for impact analysis and cost uh, support with the uh, financial modules of SAP. Now, to start the, before I go through this other feature, it's a big problem that we are always solving. We talk about this hands over and hands on. And you know, what is the problem of, of, of handing all this information? And, it's, and you see it up here. It's this huge amount of data. You saw Bupender go in depth about eye models and how they can solve an aspect of this problem. Well, that eye model, though, to bring all that data together, how did you know that that's the data that you wanted to go into that eye model? And, and that's what we've introduced is services to manage the information, the process, so it is actually available to identify, to put into the appropriate I models to then pass and hand over. So from a feature thing, we've introduced tag management services, and I'll, I'll kind of walk, I'll talk you through a demo of this, but this is highlighted in the, uh, in the uh, uh, B Award final, or the B Inspired finalist uh, Crossrail, and uh, Ross Denton's giving a talk, I believe, to, uh, tomorrow afternoon where they're an early adopter of this technology and, and are using it today. But essentially, uh, what's happening is we've, they've defined what they want their asset to be in EB. They've done work in project-wise for the overall large design, let's say, of a train station. And now we've transmitted those instructions to the contractors to go do the detailed design. Now they're going to add more information, they're going to create new information, they're going to create new models, and they're going to bring it back to us. Now, when it comes back, how do we link that information how, for a variety of reasons? How do we know we got all the information back that we need? And how can we best leverage it further on to sustain the asset into operations? So what happens here is we get these designs back, in, <coughs> and you can see here in any MicroStation-based um, product, you get it in here, you're in that environment, and you're looking at this model, and what you're seeing here on the bottom here the, in this industry, these would be called the tags. These are the definitions of the designs that we wanted to have done. And a user, in a, kind of a semi-automatic mode, identifies the components in the model to the tags that they were supposed to be. So that's a bookkeeping thing. That goes there, that's that, that's that. But once he's done that, what we do is we, first of all, now we instantly have a dashboard of, is it a complete return package? The other thing we get out of this is we extract the spatial information out of the model, bring that in EB, and then later on we publish that through GeoWeb Publisher. So now you can go to a map interface and find this component through a map, which is critical in, a, in their railway use case. And we also link the components to their EB data so that later on when you actually go to that map and pick it and it brings up the I model, you'll be in Navigator and all the engineering information that was previously stored and still is managed in EB is there to be browsed in that environment as well. So the end game is really cool. This is our first step. We'd love to have that 100% automatic, but we still need this human to kind of link these up. But we think in the future we can go even farther and, uh, and Doss has a, a, Ross Stenton has a whole use case of using this, so we're pretty excited about this handover case. Another big part of when you're managing the definition of, say, uh, and I'll take the example of a, a nuclear facility or a fleet of nuclear plants, there's a whole process around performance improvement, monitoring from a human perspective what's going on, what are we noticing is going on, and how we report. Now, in the nuclear industry, there is a, uh, in the U.S. at least, and in Europe, you must have a corrective action system, and now they've renamed the performance management systems, but in the industry, it's still normally called corrective action, where you must record everything that has gone on in your facility, show what you've done to correct it, 
And now more and more the, the best practices, and not only did we correct that issue, what are we doing to our business processes, our learning processes, our system processes to make sure it never happens again? Uh, <clears throat> so we've done a substantial uh, upgrade in this area, um, in the uh, area of safety and continuous improvement and supporting uh, more standards out of the box. Um, this is a, kind of a view of a, of, a, of, a, of a typical workflow in these areas where you initiate a condition report, there's a review process, you have to evaluate. The action may be uh, you know, a, a, a very immediate action to work, it may be a change order, it may go back to design, it may be a policy change. All this has to happen. Uh, in the US nuclear industry, we also have a direct connect to uh, IMPO and the NRC where we send these conditions when they're reported to that organization because uh, in the US by law every plant has to uh, look at these like it happened in theirs. So there's a lot of uh, server side uh, automation. At the end of this process you get a, a record. So and that record has to be managed under records management. So EV's had a records management mod module. We've used it to manage these records in the nuclear industry. And we've also managed all kinds of records. And what we've done in this release is we've had it certified for uh, DOD 5015 certification. Um, this certification we can also, uh, once um, it's, it's MoREC compliant as well uh, in, within, uh, within Europe. And it also supports, uh, obviously, from our heritage uh, the, the nuclear standards of the Department of Energy in the US. So we're pretty excited about this. There are a lot of uh, RFPs and requirements that are, you know, say you must, must be certified for this. It's a, quite a prescriptive process. You, you have a, uh, an auditor that goes through a, a, a not to be violated use case and, and, and you, uh, you get the stamp of approval from the GITC, which is a, uh, a body of the DOD. So that was what I was going to highlight on EB. There's lots of other stuff in that release, but just uh, and you'll see it being used uh, in other areas uh, uh, in our in our solutions. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, but it's not really because when I was talking about managing the information and the asset definition, as I think was pointed out in the earlier presentations, a big part of that is specifications. And we've been managing specifications at the metafile level. Like this is the document that has the specification in them. We've also been managing big object type specifications like a regulation. But until now, we haven't been able to drive in and do an elegant job of capturing the, the actual pieces of a spec of a contract seeing those as objects, having the impact at that granular level and be able to make a user experience where it's easy to consume and easy to identify. And with the acquisition that uh, Greg just announced with uh, Teak and their product SpecWave, we now have that. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Leon Gorbati, who is the founder of SpecWave, to uh, introduce you to uh, that product and where we plan to go with it. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I am actually an ex uh, Bentley developer. They uh, taught me everything that I know. So uh, if the uh, software architecture or uh, if there's any bugs in there, it's uh, all of uh, Bentley's uh, issues right from the outset. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the problem that uh, we set off to solve. Uh, specifications are the most important documents in the engineering I industry, and they really do span the entire life cycle. They tend to be very tedious, very voluminous. Uh, they, can, they can be uh, very intertwined, um, a lot of repetition between similar documents. At the end of the day, all of this ends up leading to omissions and liabilities. So we are looking forward to an information mobility paradigm that addresses safety and reliability. The solution that we've come up with, a couple of terms that we're trying to introduce to industry and sort of brand. One is uh, spec modeling. We say that this is introducing engineering rigor to specifications similar to what uh, computer aided design once did for engineering drawings. Another one is spec driven process. Engineering specifications are by definition meant to be exchanged, typically between organizations, between contractors, manufacturers. There is very little that begs interoperability as do engineering specifications. 
So spec-driven process speaks to the effect of not only coming up with a some, somewhat of a standardized way in doing specifications, we say that we are creating the standard for standards, but also driving various related business processes directly off of specifications, such as inspection, vendor data requirements, um, iterations for approvals, for comment exceptions and clarifications. These are all things that become possible directly from the specification model once the specification content becomes intelligent object. So talk a little about the product, SpecWave, um, off the shelf. It's a very rich uh, word processing application for all intents and purposes, uh, everything you'd expect, spell checking, um, uh, graphics, embedded object, etc. But the entire system is built on a rigid, enforceable spec model. No more corrupted documents, no more um, corruption introduced through copy and paste. We control the documents very, very rigidly and uh, very elegantly. The application, uh, so uh, our uh, document map is essentially a tree that maps directly to the underlying structure of the specification. The rich text area itself is, as I mentioned, a fully featured word processing application, but it is constrained, it is objectized. Um, everything, a paragraph is an object, a certain region of a paragraph that is important for some reason, such as a formal requirement um, or something that has to do with multipurposing that I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Everything is an object. Every object has its own metadata and attributes. There is the uh, identification attributes, sort of like provenance, but that speaks to the, uh, uh, you know, who created it, when it was created, and uh, then there's various other tags that can be defined administratively for reducing duplication of content and for enabling spec-driven processes such as inspection and various other things that are intimately related to engineering specifications. Uh, so for example, one spec-driven process would be multi-purpose documents. It is very typical that organizations will have documents with potentially 80% overlap, uh, maybe geographical differences, uh, maybe uh, you know you build hospitals and you build universities and the buildings are 80% diff uh, similar but have some dissimilarities. A lot of organizations will, will do uh, you know, a save as and create multiple flavors of the same document. We've come up with a paradigm where you can really maintain master documents that are richly tagged for multiple purposes that can be decomposed into just the purpose that they need to be. And um, a, a lot of, none of this is really burnt into the product. We offer a very rich um, administrative configuration paradigm that then lets the users uh, work with a very simple environment that's optimized for architects and engineers, um, does not require them to be professional uh, word processing uh, um, people. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, as uh, Alan mentioned, uh, we are a startup. Uh, we've had success with uh, some uh, large companies. Uh, we're uh, in installed in several of the uh, world's largest TPCs, CH2M Hill Engineers and Constructors, CDM Smith, uh, Consolidated Contractors Corporation. Uh, we're also talking to several owners, and uh, we have a project with British Petroleum right now. Uh, we've also had a lot of interest from architecture, and we've really created essentially a generic uh, product for uh, objectizing and uh, you know, creating intelligent documents. Uh, some people have said to us, you know, lawyers can really use your environment for iterating and having an audit trail of documents. Uh, somebody even said that uh, reporters and press people can use our document. I think that was uh, T Tom Sawyer of ENR uh, said. So uh, potentially you might uh, have both a story and a tool to write it, write it, write it with. Uh, so we're moving towards um, information mobility for very widespread adoption. And uh, we are here now moving into uh, Bentley specification services. The specifications are the most significant documents that span the entire life cycle of infrastructure and assets. SpecWave itself brings the structured text content, EB Insight for change management, together with Bentley Connect and software as a service. We move towards an environment of text object information mobility with full fidelity and full integrity. Thank you. Leon, this Leon is uh, it's his first day back at Bentley, so thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce uh, another speaker. You heard a lot about Avera uh, earlier, so I'd like to introduce uh, the former CEO and now our VP of Asset Performance, uh, Paul Marshall, to introduce you to Avera and where we're going with uh, that technology. Hello, everybody. Um, thrilled and excited to be here. My first Be Inspired. I am now. Six, seven weeks into my new life here at Bentley. 
Um, as everybody just saw on the screen and what Greg went through, there are all kinds of exciting things that we can do in the operate and maintain world. There are ways that we have only begun to start to talk about um, how a lot of what we do on the design build side, certainly from an information mobility perspective, but also from a modeling perspective and all the other product suite that we have, how do we start to think about the operate and maintain world in a different way than what we have before? So in our world, in the operate and maintain world where we have traditionally lived, uh, there's really two main areas where we are trying to solve problems for our users. One is operational performance. Stuff is breaking all over the place. How do we help them manage the uptime quality throughput of all of the various components of that facility? And the second is health and safety risk. Again, this was touched on earlier by Greg, often hard to quantify and often hard, everybody knows it's important. You're not going to walk into a room and ask anybody if they care about health and safety and environmental risk and have anybody ever say, no, we don't. Um, but helping them understand the value of that in the context of the total operation of their facility is always very important for us. So from an operational performance perspective, the main areas that we look at are helping them maximize the output of their particular facility. We help them manage downtime, and downtime to us wants to be planned downtime. There's always going to be plan there's always going to be downtime in a facility, but we want it to be planned downtime as opposed to unplanned downtime because the cost of those two are drastically significant. Transitioning from reactive to proactive, really what this means is a lot of places that operate today, you walk in, new shift comes on, they walk in and find out what ain't working. That's how they start their day. It's not working, we gotta to react to what's happening with the equipment, and we have to go out and put it back into a state where it's performing the function that it has to. We wanna switch that whole culture, and we wanna get them to a point where they're managing their assets, as opposed to their assets managing them when they come in every day. We wanna help them minimize the cost per unit of production. This really speaks a little bit to the revenue side. Mining is a good example. If you're at a coal mine, um, they can sell every piece of coal that they can pull out of the ground. Their problem is less focused on cost necessarily because the impact of a drag line breaking in the hole of a mine means that you've got 200 guys standing there looking at each other with absolutely nothing to do and the coal that they needed to ship is no longer coming out of the ground. So multi-different problems that it creates both on the revenue line and the cost line. On the health and safety side, obviously ensuring safe working conditions. When things don't break, when things don't blow up, people are safer. Relatively common sense. Um, and we're helping the state of the equipment make sure that the working conditions that those folks are operating in are much safer than they were. Environmental risks, there is no end of examples where there have been environmental risks lately. Um, won't go through naming names. Um, but there are plenty of them out there, and increasingly that is becoming a, a, not that it was never an area they focused on, but as fine folks in the press tend to highlight things, they tend to get a little more attention than otherwise they might. Understanding the consequence of failure, this is an important notion that we introduce people to, is not only do you have to understand what's happening with your equipment, how do I attack it and how do I actually prioritize my equipment and what I'm going to do with it? And part of the answer is to truly understand the consequence of the failure of that piece of equipment. If the consequence is everything keeps going and nothing really happens and I pull it out and put another one in, then the maintenance effort that's required to continue to support that should not be significant. So helping them understand and walk through those thinkings are very, very important. A few quotes that we like to use. Um, you must be able to manage and control. Uh, sorry, you must be able to control, and to be control, you must be able to measure. So we allow people to start to understand in a different context and a measurable context the performance of not only their equipment, but their entire facility. Your, this is the one that I always like. Your systems and processes are perfectly designed for the results you are getting. So if your plant is breaking, Go look at the mirror, because the way you've set it up and the way you run your processes around that facility are probably doing exactly what they're designed to do. 
Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Everybody's heard this one, but in a maintenance and operating world, it can be very, very true. So I only have 10 minutes and Alan's probably going to throw his shoe at me at some point and tell me to get down. But if we have five minutes to talk to anybody about what we do, this is the slide that we will use 10 times out of 10. If you'd like to come and talk to me about it after, I'll talk to you for half an hour, an hour, four hours, whatever you like. This is the slide we use because both pictorially, it shows where we fit in the landscape of a facility. If you look at the left hand side of the screen, that's the plant floor. Okay? There is reams and reams and reams of data coming off of the plant floor every single day. One of the single biggest problem plants and operations have is, I don't know how to manage it, I don't know what it means, I don't know how to change my work that I do every day because of it, and it becomes more painful than it does actually turning that data into actionable knowledge that's going to change the performance of your facility. So that's really what we're trying to do with everything on the left hand side. On the right hand side, as Greg pointed out, we are not, I will stop and say again, we are not a work management system. We are not SAP, we are not Maximo. That's not what we do. That is the system that allows you to be extremely efficient at what you do. You need to be good at planning and scheduling your work. You need to be good at procuring parts. You need to be good at managing inventory. All those things are critical to the successful operation of a facility. But if you are brilliant at planning and scheduling the wrong work, absolutely nothing is going to change. And that's where we're kind of sitting in the middle to help take all the data from the plant floor, help interpret that data, which is wrapped around some maintenance methodology and some strategy that we bring to them to help educate them around how you prioritize your assets, what different strategies you apply against those assets depending on consequences of failure and how important they are in your facility. We take the data in, apply it against that strategy, and then we integrate back with SAP so that we're actually changing the work that's going to happen. When the guys and girls come in the next day and they get their route sheets and they're going to run out on the floor and start doing all kinds of stuff, it's not the same stuff they did yesterday. It's now new stuff because we have better information about the equipment, we know the true condition of the equipment, and we can manage it based on what's actually happening. Okay? I will move on. We are NetWeaver certified. We are uh, IBM uh, Tivoli certified. We have been for a long time. Um, we have good relationships with both those companies. The importance of that um, two-way integration that we have with both those companies is critical to the success of what we do. If we're going to change the way people work every day, we probably need to change what's happening in the work management system. And so we work in all environments with both, SAT, with both um, IT and operations to make sure that that integration works seamlessly and that we are actually touching the points we need to. A few screenshots on here. We weren't going to go through a product demo because it does take a, a fair amount of time. But um, again, you know, happy to do that on a call or at some point if, if people have more interest in doing that. But we really take a risk-based approach, and we've talked a little bit about, about this. But things like production and cost and health and safety and taking those into account as we assess the risk of what's going on in your facility allows you to apply resources in the right spots at the right time. And that's really what we're helping to do here. So this is just highlighting different areas from a risk-based inspection perspective. This is um, essentially a dashboard that we use. And operators will sit there. You will see some flashing alarms and some flashing things on the side. And basically, those indicate where we've built a strategy for a particular piece of equipment and how it should operate. And it's operating either inside or outside the parameters of what it should be operating. So when you see things happening on this dashboard as a user, you know that there have been readings that have come in from the field, either that your folks have collected on handheld devices that we've rolled out, or through um, your DCS system, or through PI data, or vibration data, or thermography data, or all the various data points that we're going to collect. This is going to tell you when the performance of that piece of equipment is starting to deteriorate. This is a KPI dashboard. Everybody has to have one, so we do too. 
Um, this is something that, depending on what type of user you are in the organization, this will look differently. If I'm a maintenance manager, what I need to look at for KPIs is different than if I'm the general manager of that entire facility. So we can customize this based on user and based on what's important, but this is just to look at um, kind of what the UI is and, and what is presented to users uh, in terms of, of how they're going to look at and how they're going to manage that asset base. We have a methodology that wraps around all of this. So obviously when you're going in to do this and implement this with a customer, there's a certain amount of change management that's required. There's a certain amount of methodology required around how you actually go through the implementation. We have a fair, we call it work smart methodology, which aligns nicely with, uh, with a lot of what Greg um, has in his messaging, which is about working smarter. And, and, uh, and we very much agree with that. So we have a me methodology that basically wraps around the technology that makes sure we have things like organizational alignment. It makes sure that we have greater business alignment across the entire business as we're trying to roll out this initiative and really fundamentally change the way we're operating that facility. That is an ISO 55000 standard. So ISO 55000, different people may know more or less. If you know less, there's a gentleman sitting in the front row here named Terry O'Hanlon, and you need to go talk to Terry because he will tell you uh, he's forgotten probably more than I know about ISO 55000. Um, but this is very much in support. We have one customer, Scottish Power, um, who's now part of Iberdrola, which were the second, I believe, to get PAS 55 certification, which is basically a predecessor to, to ISO 55000. These are some of, the, some of the both industries and users that we have. Um, we've spent a lot of time on the three, uh, sorry, the, the four sides that you kind of see on your left. The right is a bit of a catch-all. We have a number of different verticals on the right that are represented there through um, consumer products companies, uh, pulp and paper companies. But the other four that you see is really from a product and a marketing perspective, at least up until now. Um, but now that Alan Crowley has his hands on this, I'm sure we're going to do more. Um, but that's the, that's the place we've spent our product development dollars, our marketing resources. That's where the bulk of our users are in those verticals. That does not in any way mean that this is not applicable to any other industry you can think of. Think of having listened to what you just listened to, um, some of the overlay that we have on bridges. There's no reason we couldn't apply a lot of this that we use here combined with inspect tech to bring a different solution there. There's no reason you can't use this on roads. There's no, I mean, there's, there's literally any industry you can use it on. Um, we've just have a, a user base that is built this way because that's strategically where we had decided to focus. So to some, um, you know, basically the benefits that we're looking to bring through the use of this technology is obviously an increased return on assets. That's very important. That is, um, that is a measure that when people are looking to approve any, any buy in any facility is something they're going to have to justify. The second is improved operational performance and increasing availability, shortening the outages, all those things we talked about. And the last is really managing risk. It allows you to wrap your arms around your facility and truly understand what's happening with it and to make conscious decisions around what work is going to be done every day and how do I mitigate the risks that are happening in that facility. So that basically sums up what I have for um, EXP. Again, happy to chat with any of you after. And Alan, I'll throw it back to you. So as Paul mentioned, uh, the scope of, of the Vera APM technology, uh, AssetWise itself is quite broad. And we've kind of up in this point talked a little bit, kind of plantish. Wanted to just kind of broaden that to what are we doing in, in transportation? And um, focusing, uh, in this case, uh, on, on roads. And you know, today, um, you can see the number there. Um, we're through AssetWise servers and, and, and product brands, we're, we're managing over a million miles of roads around the world that are worth $750 billion. Now, those are mostly concentrated in the, in the US and in the UK primarily, but uh, there's, there's some in Canada and other places in the world. And this list of the kinds of things we offer, you can see is quite robust, um, down to the management of the common linear network that all the information is bound to. That's very, uh, it's considered a best practice in this area for managing this particular asset type when you talk about our roads. Structure management of, of things like bridges and, and more complex uh, things. 
Um, public facing, uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of public facing sites that are actually publishing data that we're managing. Uh, we have a whole permitting uh, s software as a service that's being used in, in several states in the U.S. for truckload permitting. Where, uh, so we actually have users that are truck drivers uh, that touch our software. And, and of course, uh, in inspections. So w one, one thing we, I wanted to just inform today is, uh, is about an upcoming release of our XOR product. It's actually going to be released in first quarter. Um, but we're working with uh, the UK Ministry of Transportation and their highway agency to replace their system that manages all their basically freeways, if you will, if we call them freeways in the States, their motorways uh, in, the, in the UK. And it, we're taking what we've been doing traditionally and putting that in, which is to manage the asset itself. But the, their vision is much further. Let's manage the, the use and performance of that asset from how it's actually used. And, and to do it, what is it all about? It's how do we keep traffic moving? And how can we keep, you know, so the asset has to be structurally sound, and we have to do that work. But you can see the, the sporting events impact how it works. So if we don't know that a sporting event intersects with some construction we might want to do, or maybe the utility company needs to get under our asset, and we don't see those interferences, we're not going to plan well, we're not going to be proactive, we're going to be reactive, or we're just going to have traffic jams. And uh, you can, you know, I think if you've gone to the UK, you can see why they're motivated if you've ever driven around there much. So um, one thing we're, um, that they're going to be, uh, are currently an early adopter of, but we'll be making this uh, general release in, in 2013, is something called Network Event Manager. So this is builds on top of our, our XR asset management system for roadways. And what this does is from multiple sources uh, that are available, either public or privately, uh, to the highway agency, we're taking these events and bringing them um, and putting them in one uh, in, in, in one model, which is based on a, a common linear reference and, and geospatial map. Uh, and then all of those assets that are combined with the things we do in EB Insight for configuration management and, and impact analysis. The Network Event Manager is, this, is a tool to allow users um, at the highway agency to manage these events, create these events, and, and kind of um, define the flow of them. I have a bit of a demo here. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to follow these things if you're not in this industry. But what, what this is showing, some vent, uh, these are traffic incidences that they're getting from their public safety bureau. Those are integrated in. The user is able to look at those. Those are now part of the, the network model. They can add information to these events if they need to and augment them, relate them to other incidences. You can see choices up here, like clash detection to other events. Um, you can enter new events. So there are things that obviously the highway agency itself has plans. And, and what this is showing here is taking the results of that and pushing that out to a public site. So if you go to roadworksonline.co.uk, you can see what's being shown here. It's a public facing site that shows these works being done uh, in the UK, uh, updated continuously. And there's a, a public facing service, which is free to use. And then there's more detailed information to integrate that into, say, the you know, utilities and local mun municipalities that we offer as a pay for service. So it's a very big breath, and uh, we're we're learning uh, with the highway agency this really big use case, and we'll be introducing this uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, towards the, uh, the mid to late uh, 2013. Now, we already have XOR in the U.S., but this network event manager is a, a new feature set. Uh, you heard Greg talk about inspect tech, so that's about bridges and, and things around them. So uh, I want to reintroduce that and go in a little bit more detail. Um, Inspectech, I think it was mentioned, 100,000 bridges today managed with Inspectech. And this is a, offered as a, a software as a service. And, <clears throat> and one of its uh, really big benefits is not only, you'll see, I'll show you some examples, is it easy to use and do these inspections, but the work has been done to generate all the required regulatory forms for the federal agencies uh, in the U.S. That, that are required. And this is a big expense for a municipality or a DOT, and, and we're doing for that. So this is something that is, is primarily a, a U.S. product. As we start, we purchased uh, uh, Inspectech back in May, and we are, uh, we'll be expanding this globally as, as well as uh, you'll see some interesting integration points. But just to get a little deeper of the problem, I think many of you may have remembered in 2007 when this bridge collapsed in Minnesota. 
And as, that, as the state of Minnesota went in and did a root cause analysis of why this bridge collapsed, it, it wasn't that they weren't doing the inspections, they were, but they were all just taking them on clipboards and they had a stack of pile of paper and file cabinets. Nobody was looking at them or doing anything with them. And this thing fell apart. And if they would have been looking at what their data was showing them, they would have easily seen that this was going to happen. So this led, of course, to a lot of legislature and a lot of motion, and they went out and they benchmarked uh, systems to solve this problem for the future. And they did choose Inspectec. And so now uh, you can see the numbers there. Um, they, they've quickly expanded 16,000 bridges and culverts, and you can see in f uh, across, uh, across their whole state. And not only is this allowing them to easily collect information and make these required regulatory reports, but now that information is now in a form that they can proactively use it as part of their maintenance programs. So the way this works is there's detailed workflows. These inspections have processes, there's approvals, there's things you have to do. So there's workflows. It's flexible because every state, every DOT body kind of does it differently. Um, you're out in the field. You've got to have easy-to-use forms. Um, and you're, you're, you're basically talking to civil workers that are doing inspections. They, they expect it to be as easy as the clipboards they were using. So this is an example of, of a kind of a, a forms interface. These, uh, these are tailored uh, quite quickly for the, uh, the end user case. So, you, you want, so we stand this up for you. Again, like I said, we offer this as a service. So you buy into our service, work with you for a few weeks, and start gener uh, configuring your forms for you. Um, all kinds of experience in these assets. Uh, have you got a culvert? We know what culverts look like. You're probably looking at these things. So we got a lot of head start uh, for people in, in setting these systems up. <coughs> After you have the data, not only looking at, the, like I mentioned, the forms that you must submit, but how, how far are you in your submissions, so keeping track that you are doing your submissions on time, and then also how, how, is, how is the asset performing? Is it performing as planned, and can we impact our spend? <clears throat> you can kind of see, you know, all the things attached to bridges, uh, you know, all the way down to the guardrails and stuff tend to get in the systems. Um, we've even bled into the ski lifts in the federal park system are managed in the system. When it comes to bridges, um, they're fairly complex, so they tend to be like almost a subsystem of their own. And already, um, you know, with, with being part of Bentley, that connection to that, that, that 3D model space to help the inspector find out where he's inspecting and, and, and from just a procedural standpoint and then ease of entering that data back has already started uh, in, in, in our development group. This is a user experience. Um, this, this is uh, pretty common. You know, if you come into the web, you have a tailored uh, dashboard uh, look, if you will, uh, based on the user and how they want to see it and what information is, is, is there for them and relevant to them. They can drill in. To, to see the, the results of the forms. Some forms can be edited. They can see what they're related to. This is uh, getting ready to generate the, you can see cover letter there, reports. So this is getting ready to generate the report to the government. Pictures from on site are available. And then you can also, also publish those to a map so you can get to this data through a map UI as well. So, uh, real complimentary, as, as, as Paul mentioned, and you'll see uh, you know, the in, in spec tech technology points uh, sprouting in, in other areas of asset wise. <coughs> Greg mentioned this, but uh, I just want to reaffirm this. I, again, um, we're talking to the press and we're saying, please don't talk about it until Thursday. I don't know how that works, but uh, Ashto is an organization in, um, in the US that's made up of all the 50 state DOTs plus other. Uh, entities that manage transportation, not only road, as you can see there, air, rail, and, and water. And they're really a body for establishing best practices, working together in the industry, working out common legislature and that kind of thing. And, uh, and they're having a conference on Thursday, so they wanted to announce this at their conference on Thursday, hence the, the ask to, uh, and the press release will come out uh, on Thursday. So that's what Ashto does. Uh, and they have an arm called Ashtoware, so they actually generate software and sell it uh, to their members. And it's funded by the members and then uh, both through uh, research funding and through actual usage and purchase. And so what we're really announcing is the extension of InspectTech advanced inspection features on top of one of their modules, which they call Asset, uh, you can see it there, uh, Ashtoware Bridge Manager, used to be called Pontus. 
So if you go into the U.S. and you talk to a DOT who's doing um, who, in the department that does bridge management, they're going to know what Pontus. Pontus has this is big database and all uh, and all of the uh, algorithms for deterioration vectors of a bridge, which are the kind of things that a very exp would key off of to use. So there's a lot of touch points here. So the cool thing here for the end user is Ashtoware is generally, I think it's on every single GSA, so if you can buy Ashtoware Bridge, you can buy InspecTech to enhance Ashtoware Bridge. And if you want to buy from Bentley, we can sell it as well. And, and, and just as an FYI, through the acquisition, and we're going to continue it with this agreement, we happen to be the authors of Pontus itself. Uh, Ashtoware contracts us to do that. So we're very much embedded in, in this environment, and it's potentially something uh, you're so excited about. It could expand in, in, into other areas of Ashtoware as this rolls, but uh, we think um, this is something that uh, our end users have asked for. And so the last topic I was going to cover is just, uh, just to connect some points of some slides you've already seen around the handholds. So yeah, I know you probably haven't had a chance yet, but out by that conference center there, there's quite a few surfaces and iPads and Androids to play with, with all the apps that we are currently delivering, plus uh, some of the, um, of the ones that are still in, uh, in development. And you know, I don't think it takes much imagination of how these devices and those technologies fit into our asset-wise offering. Um, you saw what our app strategy is. It's to have these eyewear. So you, your apps download uh, to your devices. Your, the, the monetization for Bentley is through the use of the Passport. So uh, more and more of these apps will be made available, and we will be using them for intelligent graphics. So out on uh, doing a procedure on, on a shop floor, do I really want a PNID schematic? that doesn't show me I got to reach around to get something it could even be a safety issue. So immersive graphics showing procedures easier, uh, being able to, you know, you go, I don't know if you've gone to these uh, boards uh, where you've got like, you know, a hundred valves and switches, which one are you supposed to be picking? You can imagine the, uh, the uh, <coughs> with the uh, augmented reality that you should see, uh, Stefan will be showing it, our R&D guy, you'll see some uh, augmented reality examples. You could lay the, you know, you point your camera or your device at, at the valves and it'll point to the one you really need to pick with the value it should say, you know, which is pretty cool. Um, document access, so again, as Bupender showed with the eye models, uh, I'm there. I've got everything I need, could possibly need to do my job. So when, when we go and we tell through a very EXP, we tell SAP to go do a work order, the thing we've always done with EB is once that work order is issued, we generally are the ones that provide the information packet that that work requires by that individual. That's coming out of the asset definition uh, repository of asset wise. Now we have this ability to put that in an eye model, put it on a device. I'm in this plant. I've got everything I possibly need to do this job, obviously saving time. And then on the inspection side, we already have asynchronous inspections, but putting them on a new form factor that's easier uh, to use and with, with more of the immersive graphics as well. So, you know, I'm looking at what I'm, I'm doing and I can, I can uh, do it it's much easier than a clipboard. I'm gonna get better data uh, from, from the end user. So that's how we're gonna be using it. We're gonna follow the same strategy um, in these apps. Uh, as the, the apps themselves have SDKs and are part of the Bentley Developer Network. Uh, AssetWise itself has a very robust set of web services and APIs that we open up as well. So we know we're going to make a lot of these apps, but we fully expect uh, others to make these as well uh, on top of the platform. So just to recap, you know, uh, what I'd like you to take away is we continue after three years to really expand the depth of AssetWise, and I think uh, it's, it should be getting more and more obvious why we're doing this, and, and the pieces start to make even more sense uh, as we make more acquisitions and we start to pull these things together. In the area of lifecycle information management, we're moving uh, EB ahead, and it's uh, really bonding project-wise together tighter, as well as expanding our footprint in records management and in asset definition management, and with the addition of SpecWave um, into the actual detail of those, of, of those uh, instructions and specs that the assets are, are really being driven by. Uh, you saw, obviously, a takeaway with Paul's message from asset performance management. It's not enough to design and, and create and tr keep track of these assets. We really want to help them perform to their best. <clears throat> 
in transportation, we, we have a continued uh, investment in drive there, and uh, you'll be seeing more of that in actual product releases. We've been, in my opinion, a little bit quiet about that on the asset wise side, but we've done a lot of work in that, combining our, our spatial and linear referencing systems in the back end of the platform, and that stuff's going to start being exposed in 2013, and I gave you a little a hint of that. And, and that will all be augmented by you know, this, uh, this ability to, to do the inspections and, and get this data in easier uh, and through the use of these new uh, device form factors. So that's what I had to share, and we are all available for questions until quarter past, I believe. That's the way it works. Can we Paul and Leon, can you help me join me in? Okay, Paul, Mike Beeler from Burns McDonald. So let's say I get this, uh, <coughs> you showed that screen with all those little blinking yes. warning signs, right? Yes. And oh, so I know I've got problems on my system, right? Yes. But I've only got so much money to react to it. Yep. And so let's say I only get to half the things that I know that are a problem, right? The other half now I've documented that I've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Therefore now I have liability possibly to my regulators, possibly to, uh, to a, a lawyer that comes back at some point in time because I do have a, you know, an accident, let's say, yep. uh, with, with an asset. So how do you suggest as an industry that we tackle that? I mean, what, what's been your experience with some of these big utilities? So I guess my first answer to that would be in not knowing your only defense is ignorance is bliss. And I'm not sure that that's a defendable position anymore in any of the major industries, certainly, that we would operate in. So yeah, I'm not sure that standing back and saying, oh, I know, so now I have a problem is, is necessarily. I acknowledge that. I'm just repeating something that I heard that I, I happen to agree with you. That, yeah. But so I, it, I heard that from a utility guy say, hey, you know, if, yep. we, if we know it now, you know, yep. it's better so not I, to know, he claimed. I, I would, in fact, in, in terms of our users, I would say going and sitting down, A, going and sitting down with a regulator and being able to say, I know the state of my equipment. I know I have problems. One, that's going to put you probably light years ahead of the other people that they're talking to at this point. So from a regulation perspective, okay, there's issues. They know that they have issues. And while they haven't fixed them today, we can now start to figure out how we methodically plan and address for these issues as opposed to you know having no awareness of them whatsoever which frankly as a regulator would scare me more than the fact that i do actually have a clue what's happening with my facility so you know i think you're in a better position to have those conversations the second is as we start to move through this proactively go and have a conversation with your regulator tell them what you're doing Tell them how you're trying to wrap your arms around the facility. Don't wait for them to walk in one day and say, oh, you got all this stuff blinking on your thing. You know, what the heck is going on? Go to them. Say, look, this is where we are. This is what our plan is. This is where we want to get to. We want to invite you into the process. You're not the enemy. And in fact, by, by inviting them in and helping them walk through this process with you, they don't expect you to go from here to here in a day, right? Lay out the path for them. Help them understand what you're going to do and how you're going to make it not just a more efficient facility, which you know certainly they have some degree of care about, but how is it going to be a more environmentally responsible facility? How am I going to make sure that both the people who don't work in my facility, if it's a power plant, if it's a, a large facility, and the people who do work in my facility are going to be safer? So that, that I guess, would be my suggestions to them. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no, it's an easy one. I think I don't know. Uh, is is so I saw a, a Greg in his slide. It went it went rapidly, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> talked about reliability center design. So you know your your group is kind of bringing the reliability center maintenance and yes. proper functioning concept to the to this group. And so, do you anticipate that kind of um, discipline going for going? Th you know, yeah. back to the design and engineering stage? Yeah, so I, I would say at this point, Terry, the intent is, you know, reliability centered design is, is not as thought out a concept and an actual methodology as what RCM is, obviously. Um, but I think 
the desire is there now to look at the rigor that you put into a process like that and get people in a room who understand it, who are smart enough, get them to understand the fundamental principles and start to have the discussion around how do we apply, how do we change the way we do this? And, and how do we think differently about it the same way that we kind of introduce RCM concepts? So there's not, it's not there, but I, I absolutely the intent is to start to have a different conversation maybe than what's been had in the past. Yeah, it's, it's like Alan said in the beginning where the handoff, the, the challenge with the data is that it's always at the end of the project. So right. if there's any cost whatsoever to it, yep. forget it, it's out the window. And it's the same kind of thing with maintenance showing up to say, oh, we want to be involved in the design process. Right. And again, you know, there's a lot of really hard conversations, <clears throat> excuse me, in there, Terry, and you know how hard it is to get an operator and a maintainer to talk. And now we're going to try and loop engineering and design folks and architects and all those people in there. It's not, well, I mean, you know, it starts with the first step, right? And uh, I think, Terry, you know, our experience in the, in the nuclear industry, you know, I'm a big fan of it, the U.S. nuclear industry, because I think they've been forward thinking. They haven't applied all the technologies like EXP yet, but they're looking at them now, but they certainly have involved everyone in the process to keep those 104 plants that were built 35 years ago running really safely, right? And I think those best practices, we've embedded in our solution, and we see other industries coming. And as, as Paul said as well for the first question, in liability law now, it, ignorance is no excuse. And using inappropriate technology is no excuse anymore either. And so this MAP21 that was mentioned that's coming out of the U.S. government for transportation, and there's other similar regulations that are all kind of that ISO 55000 flavor. Um, you know, if people don't get it, naturally, they're going to be forced to, for sure. We're going to have to charge you extra. I actually <laughs> <laughs> talk further about that. Okay, so you're talking I'm about happy to grab a drink later if you like. And engineering and operations and all talking with each other. So let's say you've got a bridge that's got to be painted. It's in a certain condition. Let's say it's 80% condition. It gets painted. Then who records that it's been painted and it's now in its 100% condition for that particular component of the bridge? Is that something that you redispatch an inspector to do, do you, do you think? Or is the mechanism set? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the inspectic workflow processes. So you inspected it. You're going to have a, a maintenance plan to, to, to do that. You're going to report back that the work was done. So that's an integration point back from the, the work management system. But then you're going to go validate and verify it probably with another inspection. Now, if you have, if, if it's a kind of asset that you can do that automatically with sensors, obviously that's going to be more efficient. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's Remco Tucken from GIS magazine. I tell you that because that will explain my bias. Uh -huh. um, asset management and GIS are coming closer together. Okay. And how do you guys look at the totally different uh, approach of the people who have been working with uh, asset management information already. No maps, no sense of, of location, but still doing a great job anyway. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's, there's lots of different, when you look at the worlds certainly that we have operated in, there's all kinds of data out there that we don't collect that is absolutely valuable data that applies to other things that when overlaid against what we do can exponentially change the value of that. GIS is absolutely an example, right? Um, substations for some facility which are located all over the place, right? And kind of getting out to those desperate, disparate locations and making sure you know where everything is and you can access it and you have maps and you know that's all I think that's all very valuable information. There's things like energy consumption Right? There's absolutely no reason why you can't track energy consumption from a generator that is operating within your power plant. We don't do that today because it's not directly tied to how we maintain and operate that piece of equipment, but it's absolutely valuable information. And there's no reason that we can't track and report and show usage. Um, again, there's not necessarily, today we don't have a corrective action for that particular type of data, but for somebody to sit there and say, well, at 2.30 this afternoon, there was a big peak in the consumption that happened at my plant. Okay, 
what happened, right? Let's go back and actually take a look at what was occurring in the facility to create that type of an event so we can go back and try to manage those things differently. So, I mean, GIS is a great example of where I think there's a number of different aspects we can overlay against what we do. Um, and, and both... I, I it specifically because Bentley has sort of GIS for infrastructure uh, running. Yes. So part of the... Um, the asset-wise mission, and, the, and, and it was kind of leaking a little bit with the transportation, is it's, it's, it's an asset management definition process that is, by its nature, spatially enabled yeah. with linear referencing, right? So we certainly will continue to work with the GIS systems that we always have with, with our, our mapping software, like Smart Small World and Esri and those. But we really do believe it is time that there's certain asset management things that we've been talking about here that people have been, to some degree or another, if they're sophisticated enough, trying to customize into a GIS, which is just not an appropriate place to do it. So we can work with the GIS, and we will not be a GIS, but we will be a, ge we will be a geospatially enabled asset management system. And that will be new to some people. And so by not making it an option, but it's just there, it, people will start using it. And some will continue to require and need the larger GIS systems, and I think there's many use cases that they will not, much as we have many, many use cases that don't need traditional document management systems anymore. So that's why we put records management in it, right? So, and, and, and further, I think when you, when you look at the excitement for me is when you do this cross-industry stuff, you have transportation use cases that absolutely require the geospatial. And then you have other ones that maybe they, they, they don't put as much of an emphasis on it to date. But the fact that we're using a common platform, now we overdrive in that area. Or maybe you didn't ask us, but it's there. Now that it's there, now you see use. And, and that cross-pollination is going to make it a, you know, a superior solution. I believe Greg would like to say something. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't resist uh, pro provoking things here a bit. So I referred to three years ago when we chartered AssetWise to start with. And the reason we began AssetWise as an as a platform we said for asset management is what we had in mind. Uh, and, and the reason was because we believed and had found that GISs were not an adequate platform for asset management. Now al along the way uh, these other use cases have, have become very compelling uh, but I still don't think GISs are very useful as an, an asset management platform but they certainly are very useful as a platform. So something I'd like to say about AssetWise in general is we have in mind that it is the platform for very many use cases and, and, and aspects for intelligent infrastructure. We have in mind for it to be a platform for use by others as well than ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a great virtue of GIS systems. And, and I hope we can have an interface and APIs comparable to those of GIS systems. Now I believe the GIS systems sort of fade into the underlying data infrastructure, if, if you like, into the oracles and Googles of the world and, and, and so forth. But the industrial strength use cases will, will remain. I think we've made headway uh, in, in that direction and, and, in, and making everything geospatially aware uh, it has a byproduct, a virtue of making them fit well from the virtual to the physical world as as a as an incidental uh, to, to to that so so that's been an advantage as well but the charter of asset wise to start with was to improve on a GIS for a asset management platform now improve on for us means we don't have to challenge a GIS system is still there for its for its purposes and our, uh, our our theme in much of what we do is let's get more value out of the GIS system and let's help it be more valuable at the same time without without conflicting and, and needing to supersede it necessarily. So, so how would you uh, challenge the argument that every asset has a location in the first place as an attribute to what it is? Uh, uh, th I, uh, that's yeah, absolutely the case. That's why I, li I like this notion of the, if you like, intelligent positioning, which, which, which uh, you know, you w we should expect in the Internet of Things that the things have... Uh, positions and pulses, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we sh have a great uh, head start toward that uh, thanks to the Ivara acquisition and its role uh, as listening to find the actionable consequence yeah. of a stream of too much data when things communicate their position and their pulse.
right, well, again, thank you all for attending. Uh, we're all around uh, throughout the week to uh, answer questions one-on-one -on -one, uh, and encourage you to look at the, the demonstration areas we have in there, and I look forward to uh, seeing you at dinner tonight. So thank you again. Thank you.